Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. Our presentation today is entitled Modeling Lipid and Glucose Metabolism Using Human iPSC-Derived Hepatocytes. I'm Jeff Bogoliskis, technical editor for GEN, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar presentation. The recapitulation of native cellular and physiological behavior is critical for accurate phenotypic screening and target identification, techniques which are paramount to both academic and biopharmaceutical researchers. Within the study of metabolic diseases, limitations of classical in vitro cell models are becoming increasingly evident, causing investigators to seek out improved alternatives. Induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, have provided investigators with reproducible, well-characterized, and a readily available source of various human cell types that are the logical alternative to current human cell models, thus ensuring advancements in basic biology and applied biomedical research. Let's meet our panel for this gen webinar, who will illustrate how human iPSC-derived hepatocytes can facilitate research into human metabolic disorders. Our first speaker today is Kobe Carlson, Strategic Marketing Manager at Cellular Dynamics International. Dr. Carlson will provide us with background information on iPSC-derived hepatocytes and the numerous applications where these cells can be and are currently being utilized. Our second presenter is Siobhan Mullaney, Director of Translational Biology at Sanford Burnham Priebus Medical Discovery Institute. Dr. Mullaney will discuss her work using iPSC-derived hepatocytes in the study of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Before our speakers get started, I want to encourage the audience to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentations. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, so simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and hit submit. All right, with all the particulars out of the way, let's get our presentation started. Kobe, take it away. All right, thank you, Jeff, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. I would like to start by introducing you to the liver. The liver is a vital organ that supports nearly every other organ in the body in some way or another. It is estimated that there are nearly 500 different functions of the liver, and several of them are listed here. These functions range from controlling the levels of fats and amino acids and cholesterol and glucose in the blood to storing vitamins and minerals and other essential chemicals. It also produces bile and breaks down food and converts it into energy, and while at the same time neutralizing and destroying drugs, tox toxins, and infectious particles. Hepatocytes are the most abundant cell type in the liver, and they are responsible for performing the majority of these many different functions. Because of the importance of the liver and the role that hepatocytes play in human physiology, it should not be surprising that a great number of people are, in, are interested in research using this cell type. In fact, if you are registered for this webinar today, it is highly likely that you have used or are planning to use some type of hepatocyte-like cell pictured here. And examples of existing hepatocyte cell models are transformed cell lines like HEPG2, or the HEPA-RG cell line, uh, primary liver cells from an animal like a rat, and of course, the gold standard, primary human hepatocytes, often abbreviated here as PHH. So these different hepatocyte-like models are being used in all facets of biomedical research, including bioengineering, cell therapy and regenerative medicine, infectious disease, specifically hepatitis, and safety toxicology studies. And a relative newcomer to this field are hepatocytes derived from human iPSCs, or induced pluripotent stem cells, which are going to be the topic of this webinar today. Okay, so iPSC technology has been around for over a decade now already. And many reviews are in the literature, and there are simple overviews summarizing this technology all over the internet. So therefore, I'll keep my description fairly brief. And while there have been numerous improvements in the methodologies along the way, the basic principle has 
pretty much stayed constant and is illustrated here in this schematic. The starting point is an adult cell, preferably a blood or skin sample, that can be obtained from any individual, and that is any human donor. And these cells can be exposed to known reprogramming factors to induce them to revert back in time, basically back to a pluripotent stem cell state. And at this point, iPS cells can propagate indefinitely as well as be manipulated genetically with tools such as talons or CRISPRs. And then through various differentiation protocols for cell specialization, these stem cells can be instructed to give rise to just about every other cell type in the human body. And it is these methods, these core competencies, needed to generate and maintain and genome engineer and differentiate iPS lines that our company, CDI, headquartered here in Madison, Wisconsin, was founded upon. And it is this transformative potential of iPSC technology, essentially how it is enabling for drug discovery, safety toxicology, and regenerative medicine. That was the reason, really, that Fujifilm acquired CDI over a year and a half ago, nearly two years now. Okay, next, where might iPSC-derived cells contribute to the success of your specific project or fit into your current workflow? Well, if you're using one of these commonly employed hepatocyte cell models introduced a couple slides ago, you are obviously familiar with the benefits and advantages of primary human hepatocytes, or hep G2s even, for example. But you are also probably aware of the limitations. So this slide here addresses some of the feature benefits of iPSC-derived cells in comparison to the more traditional options. And you can see here in the red text boxes that the limited availability and high variability of primary human cells, the lack of key functionalities of recombinant or transformed cell lines, and the poor representation of human diversity or the translation to the human condition with animal models has really underscored the importance of iPSC technology and has motivated researchers to consider other sources. So why iPSC? Well, simply put, one of the clear advantages of iPSC technology is that it offers the unique possibility of an unlimited and renewable source of hepatocytes from theoretically any individual donor. In addition to access to such supply and diversity, the fact that iPS cells can give rise to virtually any cell type in the body, I think will prove quite valuable, and we will touch on this later. You know, but since it is really probably unreasonable to expect hepatocytes, either iPSC-derived or primaries, to gain mature functions or to retain their existing functionality in isolated monocultures grown on a flat 2D surface, it's really more likely that co-culture or 3D scaffolds or bioengineered devices will be required uh, to build a better in vitro liver model. And it makes really logistical sense to leverage the same donor iPSC line to make other cell types necessary to populate such complex systems down the road. And finally, one of the true promises of iPSC technology is this concept of modeling human disease in a dish and using iPSC-derived cells to not only understand mechanism of the pathophysiology, but also to identify a measurable disease phenotype and perform library screening against that phenotype in an assay. And one way to really see this idea through to a reality is to ensure consistency. And I was reminded recently of this phrase, consistency is born by process. And I think that's where CDI comes in. And we're all about process here at CDI. And the industrialized protocols that we have developed here allow for the production of human hepatocytes at a quantity, quality, and purity that is really unmatched in the field. And you know, I think, admittedly, hepatocyte differentiation and subsequent cryopreservation of the cells is very challenging. And the level of functionality expected uh, has a bar that has really been set quite high by mature 
adult primary human hepatocytes. So while the integration of stem cells into labs using hepatocytes or hepatocyte-like cells has been described as promising or a work in progress, uh, we think there have been some exciting developments uh, in terms of longer survival and culture and improved function that we'll share about in the next few slides. And although I only focus on a few of these features really centered around glucose metabolism, I think that these characteristics support the story that Siobhan is going to present in the second half of this webinar today. Okay, so CDI has presented on the characterization of our hepatocyte product before, and they are known as iCell hepatocytes. So I am intentionally going to be a bit light here because uh, this extensive data set can be viewed elsewhere, you know, and that's not really the intent of this webinar. But suffice it to say that these cells express all the traditional markers such as HNF4-alpha and AAT. Um, they make and secrete both albumin and urea over time. Uh, they express phase one metabolizing enzymes like CYP1A2, 2C9, 3A4, and I don't have this P450 data on this particular slide, but if you look over here on the left-hand side, you know, the iPSC-derived hepatocytes really have a beautiful cell morphology where they exhibit the typical cubic or cobblestone shape. There are tight junctions and extensive bile canaliculi formation, as indicated by the yellow arrows, and there's clear binucleation. You can see the cells circled in blue. So importantly, we use all of these different characteristics of the cells to generate um, release criteria. And we have a QA, QC department here at CDI that evaluates every batch or lot of cells that we manufacture. And I think that really the results are pretty good because by looking at the picture that's below on the left, you know, that are primary human hepatocytes in culture, you know, those two images, they look very comparable, maybe perhaps not even unreasonable to, su to, su to suggest indistinguishable. But like I said, rep reproducing all or even most of the functions of the gold standard primary human hepatocyte is a major hurdle that none of the current protocols out there have achieved. And I'm really including our own here. But I'd just like to go through a few more examples of how the implementation of iPSC-derived hepatocytes has advanced research and has overcome some of the problems associated with other models. First, there are some clear wins with respect to long-term viability and culture with these cells. In 2D, there is no need for matrigel overlays or collagen sandwich cultures, and they regularly last at least two weeks in culture. And I'm not showing that data right here, but what you're seeing now is if we make 3D spheroids using a protocol developed recently, we can easily keep the cells out to four or five weeks as pictured here. And this makes them suitable for long-term toxicity studies with repeat dosing, for example. Next, we have high confidence in our lot-to-lot -lot consistency. And many of the assay protocols that we are developing to work with these cells are robust across multiple different donors. As mentioned earlier, making different cell types from a single iPSC line and using them to build a more complex co-culture system is in the works. And pictured here are iCell hepatocytes together with iCell macrophages, which exhibit phagocytic properties and are thought to operate like Kupfer cells. These data here compare the basal P450 enzyme activity of primary human hepatocytes as determined by LCMS to that of iPSC-derived hepatocytes. Two takeaways here. One, the different samples of primaries display significant variation. And you can see the black circles here. There's a nearly tenfold distribution in the data. Whereas, second takeaway, the improvements that we are making to hepatocyte culture, including media optimizations and 3D spheroid culture, are finally putting the SIP activity of these cells within an, within an acceptable and comparable range 
And this data is really quite tight. You can see the green triangles here. Finally, hepatotoxicity has been one of the primary applications for our hepatocytes. And we have contributed to some very nice studies as of late, like the one here shown in collaboration with molecular devices. And, but you know, the possibilities with these cells goes way beyond tox. And this brings me to the next slide. We just talked about long-term hepatotoxicity, which is really being enabled to a great extent by 3D spheroid cell culture. And so it's appropriate that those two images go side by side. Um, these hepatocytes can also be transduced using tools like BACMAM to express GFP in this example. And they can also be transfected with siRNA oligos against GFP here to modulate gene expression. Uh, we have placed these cells on various instruments and developed protocols to get you started testing them. And that includes the Seahorse XF analyzer to measure the bioenergetic properties of I-cell hepatocytes. Uh, moving on, we have also used HTS-compatible assay technologies such as HTRF or alpha Liza to interrogate cell signaling pathways and quantify certain biomarkers such as PCSK9, pictured here, and that is released following treatment with atorvastatin. Uh, we showed on the previous slide basal P450 activity, but SIP induction is also improving in these cells. And lastly, human iPSC-derived hepatocytes are proving to be a unique and powerful system to model the infectivity of hepatitis viruses like HPV and HCV. Okay, now that we have covered all that data to hopefully put us on the same page here for the remainder of the webinar, we are ready to get into hepatic glucose metabolism. And basically what this schematic shows us is that the hormones insulin and glucagon work together by acting on the liver to maintain stable blood glucose levels. And when your blood sugar is too high, the pancreas releases insulin, which signals to the hepatocytes in the liver to stop making glucose by either storing more of it away as glycogen or by downregulating the metabolic pathways that make it, such as glycogenolysis or gluconeogenesis. Glucagon, on the other hand, has the opposite effect to that of insulin and can stimulate an increase in the concentration of glucose in the bloodstream when it is too low. Now, because of the many liver functions, such as the breakdown of proteins and lipids, there are many non-carbohydrate precursors around in this organ and available as gluconeogenic substrates, including alanine and glutamine, which are amino acids, glycerol from triglycerides, and other metabolic byproducts like lactate and pyruvate. So we figured that if we wanted these iPSC-derived hepatocytes to recapitulate one of the more important functions of a liver cell, we should really develop an assay for gluconeogenesis. And that is exactly what we did here. So let me walk you through the data. Uh, first of all, if you look at the images in the center here, which are a past staining of glycogen, you can see that when the cells are starved on the left-hand side, there's relatively weak staining. But after the cells are fed with fresh new media, which does include insulin, you can see that after four hours, on the right side, the past staining is much stronger or a deeper pink or purple color. And this indicated to us that there was a lot of intrinsic metabolism going on here. So look, thinking about gluconeogenesis, there were a lot of parameters that could affect the assay, uh, including the most appropriate precursor substrate or substrates to feed the cells and how long to stimulate the cells with hormones to activate or inhibit gluconeogenesis. And after all this assay development, what we discovered was that many of the physiologically relevant molecules mentioned earlier really worked for these cells to be used as substrates to convert into glucose. 
uh, a, a side note, we even you know, had a customer who was working with these cells and in this sort of system, and he described them as metabolic monsters. But you know, anyway, in this data shown here, you know, the titration of insulin on the left and the dose response of glucagon on the right, um, we found that lactate ended up being the most important substrate for a robust gluconeogenesis assay and treatment times of about six hours with either insulin or glucagon really gave the best results. Okay, this physiological readout of glucose production can be complemented by dissecting the cell signaling events involved following stimulation with insulin or glucagon. The insulin signaling pathway shown here in the schematic on the left is well characterized and there are many biochemical tools available to quantify activation of the pathway, primarily by detection of phosphoproteins following the cascade of kinase events. Here we used assay kits from SysBio to look at increased phospho-AKT at both sites, threonine 308 and serine 473 after treatment with insulin. We also observed a decrease in the assay signal when the pathway was blocked with the inhibitor PI-103. Additionally, in these bottom two graphs, the downstream phosphorylation events on mTOR and GSK3 beta were also responsive to the increasing concentrations of insulin. And these data together are a simple demonstration of how dissecting the phosphorylation state of these proteins can be used to understand mechanism, if necessary. And these data indicate that I-cell hepatocytes have an intact insulin signaling pathway. Now for glucagon. The receptor is a GPCR and not a receptor tyrosine kinase, or RTK, RTK, as is the case for the insulin receptor. Stimulation of the glucagon receptor results in activation of adenylate cyclase and increased levels of cyclic AMP inside the cell. Glucagon receptors are mainly expressed in the liver, and since we saw earlier the functional response to glucagon in the gluconeogenesis assay, we sought to measure the second mes messenger cyclic AMP with the HTRF assay. And this is a simple and sensitive system, but you really have to think about the data a little bit backwards here, meaning that there is high fret in the absence of any cyclic AMP you know, with untreated cells or at low concentrations of glucagon, but when the cells are stimulated with an agonist, that is with glucagon or these related ligands, and the levels of cyclic AMP increase in a dose-dependent manner, in a dose-dependent manner, this breaks up the FRET complex and we observe a decrease in the signal. So a loss of signal in the assay indicates an increase in cyclic AMP production. And it's good to know that glucagon signals to cyclic AMP in these cells because it is known that the rate of gluconeogenesis is regulated through this second messenger pathway. And increased levels of cyclic AMP also promote glycogen breakdown. So these two influences on the production of glucose uh, really could be studied in iPSC-derived hepatocytes. You know, and remember, they could be studied in a normal individual or from a donor with some degree of metabolic disease. So I want to spend the last couple of slides tying this all together, going from really specific to opening it up to big picture. And this first example is that we have also measured insulin-dependent effects on gluconeogenesis in 3D spheroids of human iPSC-derived hepatocytes. Uh, listening to that, I think that's actually pretty cool. You know, and what this means is instead of using hepatocytes in 96 well format with about 30,000 cells per well, we can miniaturize the assay to use about only 2,000 cells in a 3D spheroid. And this takes advantage of the benefits of moving hepatocytes from 2D to 3D, as discussed earlier, and couple this with a very sensitive luminescent glucose detection assay and then we can reproduce the gluconeogenesis result that was featured a few slides back. 
So this is something we are exploring further, but um, CDI has all the protocols in place if you are interested in uh, running these sorts of assays. Okay, I would like to summarize by saying that even at this current state, human iPSC-derived hepatocytes definitely have a place in the game when it comes to the available cell models for studying some of the many different functions of the liver. And the chances are pretty high that CDI, in particular, has a great chance to drive this field forward given the high quality human cells that we make, the time we spend optimizing conditions such as media for different differentiation and cell culture protocols, um, and the applications team that we have at CDI, which is dedicated to improving the functional performance of all of our cell types in any way possible. And now this connection to Fujifilm that is bringing some of the technology uh, that was developed years ago for making color negative film and applying it to biomedical research in the form of materials and scaffolds for 3D cell culture. And altogether, you know, this really lays the foundation for a company to be able to provide the tools to build a complex liver model, as I suggested earlier in the webinar. So IPSC technology enables the generation of all the complementary and likely required cell types, such as macrophages, hepatoblasts, mesenchymal, cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and endothelial cells. And when placed into the right device or in the proper system, it is possible that amazing things will happen. So I will end there. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to thank the people we have collaborated with to generate many of these data. And we have worked with several different groups using iCell hepatocytes along the way. And their company logos were placed on the slides where appropriate. And I'd like to thank in advance uh, Siobhan Mullaney from SBP. We are pleased to be presenting alongside her and are very much looking forward to her part of the webinar because everyone knows that the second half is always better than the first half. So thanks again for your time, and goodbye. Thanks, Cody. That was a great presentation to get us started. I think our audience now has a greater appreciation of the usefulness and versatility of iPSC-derived hepatocyte. Before we move on to Siobhan's presentation, I want to remind everyone to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and hit Submit. All of our speakers will be available to answer your questions after the final presentation. All right, with that, Siobhan, the floor is yours. Thanks for joining today. My name is Siobhan Mullaney, and I'm going to talk about our drug discovery platform in human iPSC-derived hepatocytes as a model of liver disease. Our area of interest is in uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD. This is certainly an area uh, that has gotten a lot of attention in the pharmaceutical industry. It's a growing epidemic globally. As uh, much as 30% of the U.S. population has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and hyperlipidemia are all associated with NAFLD. And so this patient population has a higher incidence of uh, NAFLD. And about a third of that population is progressing to the more severe progressive form, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or NASH. And uh, this can lead to liver-related morbidity and mortality. So there's been some great advancements in the clinic. Uh, however, this, the precise mechanisms leading to NASH remain poorly understood. And so we're interested in building a cell-based model in human iPSC-derived hepatocytes that is characteristic uh, between the statosis stage, which is a benign prognosis, and this NASH stage, uh, a, sort of a pre-NASH uh, model of this disease for drug discovery. The development of our cell phenotype in the iPSC hepatocytes uh, involves a, a multi from approach uh, delivering insults to the liver that will 
deregulate de novo lipogenesis, and this is the, the pathway that's taking uh, newly synthesized fatty acids uh, and converting them into triglycerides, phospholipid, for storage and energy utilization. So we're uh, exposing the cells to monosaturated fatty acid as well as saturated fatty acids, so indicative of a high-fat diet. And this is increasing the triglyceride um, content and free fatty acid pools to drive to statosis. Uh, and saturated fatty acids are also uh, creating stress on the endoplasmic reticulum, or the ER. So the ER is uh, responsible for calcium homeostasis, lipid synthesis, storage, and export. And uh, um, the, the stress of, of ER stress has been implicated in uh, development of statosis and progression of statosis to NASH. So in addition to incubating the cells with free fatty acid mixture, we're also adding in thapsigargan, which directly uh, works on the ER to block the cell's ability to pump in calcium. So what we've created is this vicious cycle in the liver, which is contributing to um, the de novo lipogenesis, liver lo uh, lipid load, but also then impairing the ER's ability to restore lipogenesis and homeostasis. And so we get then driving the liver to fat accumulation, inflammation, and the ballooning of the liver, which is a more of a phenotype for, for NASH. In terms of the cells themselves, the phenotype, uh, detection of the phenotype is a 2D a high content imaging platform. And we are uh, uh, showing the nuclei in blue uh, Herx dye and the lipid content by using a Bodipi green dye. So vehicle treatment of BSA DMSO gives us our normal liver phenotype, and the mixture of oleic acid, palmitic acid, uh, then you see an increase in that green color and lipid content, and this is more of a fatty liver cetosis phenotype, and then we're driving that even further with the addition of thapsigargan to have a statotic phenotype with chronic ER stress, which is more of a pre-NASH phenotype with the multiple insults acting together. Our disease and dish strategy is twofold. So we've developed this robust 384 well, high content phenotypic platform using the human IPSC derived hepatocytes. And we are looking at chemogenomic screening using an annotated compound set where we know what the compounds are acting on in terms of the, the gene family uh, and target and target pathway. So by using this annotated library set on our phenotypic platform, we can understand polypharmacology and uh, identify potential target pathways for NAFLD. On the other side, we've looked at transcriptomics and uh, the gene expression profile of our treated cells versus our uh, control cells, control treatment, and we have uh, more than 300 uh, differentially expressed genes. And by this uh, approach, we can also look at potential target pathways. And so these are very powerful tools then to build in targets and pathways onto our phenotypic platform that is a human relevant disease model. We are using the ICL, ICL hepatocyte version two. Uh, this is uh, the first um, stage from the ICL hepatoblast, and we uh, mature those, differentiate those uh, for one week in culture, and uh, this has just worked very well for us in terms of reproducibility uh, and uh, robust response in the cells, so we haven't deviated from, from this protocol. Our image and data analysis workflow incorporates the, the development of this platform with, with the seven-day culture of the cells, drug exposure, the free fatty acid treatment with Epsigargan, the 24-hour incubation. We fix the cells, stain them, and then do the image acquisition using an Operetta uh, um, high-content imager in 20x objectives in several fields per well. And we use a Columbus um, software system to do the image analysis to detect nuclei, whole cell, and spot detection 
which is um, proportional to the neutral lipid load, so we can quantify the amount of lipid with whole cell spot detection. This slide shows uh, nicely the, uh, um, the, the progression to this uh, lipid loading in the cells. Uh, the top row from um, left to right is the oleic acid um, increasing, which you see very minimal green or lipid content. And the middle row is the addition of um, palminic acid with oleic acid. And there's an increase, a nice increase in lipid content. And then certainly on the lower level, we now see when we add that cigargan and increase palminic acid, we see a significant increase in uh, the lipid content. And the cells are still a nice monolayer and uh, morphologically healthy, but still uh, um, we see a nice uh, lipid content. Quantification of that slide I just showed is shown here. We have uh, a nice um, integrated spot signal fold change on the x-axis and an increase in the green bars for the free fatty acid. Uh, that's the Gargan alone, TG, in purple, uh, shows a minimal increase in lipid um, spot signal. Uh, then it's the combination of the thapsogargan and the free fatty acid, acid mixture that we see this saturation and this uh, tenfold um, difference in spot signal or lipid content. And this is really the, the highest we've seen for um, inducing lipid in accumulation in hepatocytes uh, without an overt cytotoxicity. And this is uh, showing then as a screening platform, nice statistics between our positive control wells, which are the thapsogargan free fatty acid treated wells, versus the negative control wells, which is the BSA DMSO treated wells. So a nice dynamic range um, and um, uh, Z primes in terms of screening at, at 0.5. And then there, in terms of an ATP content, we don't see an effect um, on cell viability which is very important to note because we are uh, really stressing the liver and the endoplasmic reticulum, which should be turning on apoptosis pathways. Uh, so we have this very delicate balance in stressing uh, the cells to be uh, moving toward a pre-NASH phenotype, but yet we don't have the apoptotic events or cytotoxicity occurring. And so to validate this platform, we used a, a bit of colic acid, uh, or in 747. Uh, this is in uh, late um, trials for NASH. It's uh, approved for um, bile duct injury. And it is a uh, agonist of the nuclear receptor, FXR, which FXR deficient mice have been characterized uh, by hepatocytosis, agonist of X FXR, regulate glucose triglyceride metabolism. So this was a very nice clinical control to be able to have uh, to show that it dose-dependently inhibited our phenotype and with a, a, a potency range that's um, uh, similar to reporter assays using uh, in 747. Now that we have a very nice, robust screening platform um, with a, a strong phenotype, uh, we've uh, signed a, a uh, material transfer agreement with AstraZeneca to use their annotated compound library set of 13,000 compounds. Uh, so these are compounds where it's known what um, target family they uh, uh, modulate um, or what target pathways they modulate. And so we'll be screening this library to understand from the hits and the non-hits together uh, what we are uh, modulating in our phenotypic screen and using the um, IPSC uh, hepatocytes from cellular dynamics. So the, using the normal IPSC hepatocytes uh, has uh, been a, a great tool and platform to develop the screening platform uh, that's robust and reproducible um, and uh, versatile, and, and, but the ultimate goal is to, to use patient specific samples, and uh, CDI has more recently gained access to several lines 
of, um, uh, from the CIRM bank that uh, include uh, lines with mutation directly um, connected to NASH, and um, they are currently developing those um, into iPSC-derived hepatocytes. So we really look forward to adding these uh, cell lines to our drug discovery um, uh, cascade. So uh, post-screen, we can look at how our uh, compounds would affect actual patient-specific iPSC-derived hepatocytes. So I've, I've taken you through our one approach is to build this uh, platform and use it as a screening drug discovery platform. And the other approach was uh, transcript omics and to investigate the differentially expressed genes in our treated cells. So we've done this uh, RNA-seq profiling, and uh, we're uh, currently going through the expression data. This um, shows a volcanic plot here with um, iPathway guide. And we see about 323 differentially expressed genes. And so this shows in the red dots those that are uh, either up or down regulated and that have a significant fold change or p-values. And then we've since looked at uh, more of the ER stress pathways and done gene clustering for individual genes. So it was good to, to know that of the uh, differentially expressed genes, we had 11% of those of the, the yellow pie piece uh, shown here uh, that are directly related to the ER stress mm -hmm. uh, pathways. And so that really uh, validates that we are turning on um, uh, these pathways within uh, the ER stress that should be linked to a liver statosis uh, pre-NASH phenotype. So honing in on the, the ER stress um, pathways, uh, this uh, shows there are three um, there there are three transmembrane protein pathways um, as shown here, and we are affecting uh, in terms of p-value in the dark blue several genes within each of these different transmembrane proteins that are part of the unfolded protein response that uh, helps the ER cope with overload. And we're seeing some significant fold change in the dark red, uh, red color um, for uh, many of these genes. So we're affecting um, really all three of the uh, pathways within the unfolded protein um, pathway of the ER. So to take that even farther and, and break these out as each one of these uh, pathways that's shown here in this slide. Uh, so, for example, um, in the uh, PERC pathway, we have the red arrow showing those genes that are upregulated in our system um, of our treated cells with free fatty acid, that's the gargan, in comparison to our BSA treated cells. Uh, so, we see, for example, an upload of CHOP, which turns on apoptosis. Um, we're also affecting the IRE1 pathway and X. Xbox protein one, and so these um, these pathways activate in the nucleus um, the transcription of a set of factors that allow restoration of the ER homeostasis. So if we're affecting really the ability of the ER to restore um, homeostasis, and that contributes to this dysregulation of of de novo lipogenesis. The key points here, I've talked about our robust high-content phenotypic pre-NASH platform, uh, that's a gargan, the ER stressor in combination with the free fatty acid worsens the cytotic phenotype and is uh, more, we believe, a, a pre-NASH phenotype. Uh, we have very good statistics for screening as the prime is 0.5 uh, between our control and treated uh, wells and uh, the clinical compound uh, in 747 shows a nice dose-dependent inhibition of our phenotype, and this compound is, does play a role in controlling hepatostatosis. Um, on the transcriptome analysis side, there were 323 differentially expressed genes, and many of these were ER stress markers in the treated cells, and also targeting specifically the unfolded protein response pathway. All of this work was uh, 
really performed by Madalena Parafati. She's a research fellow from um, University of Catanzaro in Italy, very talented scientist, and has uh, done amazing work um, on this project. We hope to, to publish her work soon. She's been supported um, internally by a diversified translational laboratory initiative, um, which has involved uh, multiple investigators, um, including myself from translational biology, uh, Fredun Rajinazad, Sepeda Corazonazea, in, uh, me in metabolic disease area. And it's also supported in part by NIH uh, R01 grant. Uh, Ada Koo, who uh, was a previous researcher in my lab, um, originally developed the oleic acid lipid accumulation model and high content model for which all of this was really built out of. And she's uh, gone on to pursue her PhD and, and work at um, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And so thanks to the Conrad Previs Center for Chemical Genomics, the Genomic Core and Bioinformatics Core at Stanford Burnham Previs, uh, Cellular Dynamics, and AstraZeneca Open Innovation Program. And uh, thank you for listening. That was great. Thanks, Siobhan. You provided the audience with some great insight into the importance of liver disease research and how the iPSC-derived hepatocytes facilitated your work. Before we start the Q&A session, I want to let everyone know this is their final chance to submit your questions for our speakers. Uh, it looks like we've got some really great questions already, but I'm encouraging the audience to keep them coming. Simply type your question into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen and hit submit. Okay, since we already have some really great questions, let's begin the Q&A so that we can get to as many of the questions as possible. Bear with us for a few moments while the presenters collect their thoughts and we get everything in order for the final part of the webinar. All right, everyone. So let's start off with the first question. Uh, Kobe, the first question is for you. One of our audience members uh, had said, I'm thinking about your slide that shows various stages of your iPSC differentiation. Approximately how long does it take those, different, uh, those different hepatocyte products? All right. Hey, hi there, Jeff. Uh, thanks for the question. You know, um, each step basically takes about 10 days, really. So from hepatocyte to, I mean, from iPSC to hepatoblast, it takes 10 days. From hepatoblast to hepatocyte 2.0, as we call it, it, takes 10 days. And then working with hepatocyte 2.0s to get to this 1.0 stage it takes about 7 to 10 days. So it's really about 30 days in total to get a hepatocyte that we can suggest to start working with. All right, thank you, Kobe. Siobhan, question for you. Um, how are you uh, accessing cytotox assessing cytotoxic cyto sorry, cytotoxicity and apoptosis in cells after exposure to thapsogargan and palmitic acid? Yeah, thanks for the question. It's it's very important. I did mention a little bit on the morphology side uh, in the high content platform that we're looking at brightness and shape and size of nuclei, but in addition to that, because thapsogargan does turn on apoptosis and palmitic acid can cause lipotoxicity, that we further looked at live cell imaging using a caspase 37 dye for apoptosis. And we also looked at reactive oxygen species uh, through live cell imaging as well. And so the morphology of the nuclei, as well as the, the ROS and caspase 37 activation, we didn't see in all of our treatments any significant effect um, in, in those assays. So we're pretty confident then that at least at the stage that we're testing these uh, and treating these cells, that we're in a more cytoprotective um, mode, and we are, have not yet tapped into the, the cell death pathways. Great. Thanks, Siobhan. Uh, Kobe, next question for you, uh, more of an important logistical question. One of our audience members would like to know how many cells of the I-cell hepatocytes? Yeah, so how many cells are in the vial of uh, hepatocytes? So there are about, um, you know, eight or nine million cells in a vial. Um, you know, these are terminally differentiated. They are not proliferating to a d degree that where you can keep culturing them and use them over and over. So one vial is enough for at least one 96-well plate in 2D format. And, you know, as I mentioned during the webinar, of course, you can get many more plates if you move to 3D cell culture. So eight to nine million per vial. Great, thanks, Kobe. 
Siobhan, another question for you. Uh, is lipid secretion modified in the treated cells? Yes, great question, because this kind of starts to hit on potential mechanism. In, because in our phenotypic platform, we could be affecting uptake or synthesis, export, oxidation, a number of things. And so we have started to look into lipidomics and lipid biomarkers. Uh, I can say that in looking at the free fatty acid secretion in the media that we do see similar, a very equivalent level uh, between the treated cells and the untreated cells in the amount of free fatty acids secreted. So because we're adding in all this exogenous lipid in our treated cells, then that really suggests that we are actively uptaking the lipid. We also seem to be impairing export. We have looked at levels of ApoB100, for example, which is an important lipoprotein that's um, part of the very low density lipoprotein vesicles and uh, induced with ER stress. So it does look like we're actively uptaking and impairing export. All righty, thank you, Siobhan. Kobe, another question for you. Uh, one of our audience members writes, one issue with isolated primary hepatocytes from animals is the rapid dedifferentiation after dissociation. Uh, what is the timeline of dedifferentiation for these IPS-derived hepatocytes? Yeah, another good question, and that really goes to some of the, the limitations that I mentioned on one of the early slides about using primaries. Um, you know, dedifferentiation means that the hepatocytes revert back to a more fibroblast-like phenotype or cell morphology. This happens within, you know, a very short period of time uh, after thaw with primaries. And this is, you know, this common problem. Um, <clears throat> you know, they ultimately lose their hepatocyte morphology and their function. Um, iPSC-derived hepatocytes, on the other hand, really can maintain their hepatocyte morphology for you know, three to four weeks uh, post-thaw. And, you know, again, this isn't something that's a real quantitative measurement. This is how they look. But we've, you know, kept ourselves uh, in culture and not seen any dedifferentiation up to nearly four weeks. Uh, Siobhan, a question for you. One of our audience members uh, asked for a little bit further explanation. Uh, they didn't understand what you were doing with the AstraZeneca compounds. Right, yeah, thanks for that, because this, I think, is an important strategy, so happy to explain it. But AstraZeneca has a 13,000 compound set that's uh, available to academic labs through a, um, an application process, and they know a lot of, they have a lot of information about these compounds in terms of if they are kinase inhibitors or specific you know, selectivity profiles. They have all of that collected into this set. So what's nice to use it on a phenotypic platform is that we can look at the compounds that decrease the lipid load as well as increase. So those would be anti-hits as well as those that do nothing and do bioinformatics based on the information for these compounds to to really start to tease out uh, what actual pathways or, or specific targets we might be hitting in the phenotypic uh, platform. All right, thank you, Siobhan. We have a, a couple more questions for you. Um, one of our audience members asks, have you guys had a chance to test the assay conditions for the induced uh, NAFLD or NASH model in other hepatocyte-like cells? For example, do you think this would work if you simply use the HEP-G2 cell line, uh, or do you think INT-747 would display the same inhibitory pharmacology? Yeah, this is a good question because uh, um, obviously the, the, uh, they're, it's cheaper to use the HEP-G2 cells. They are um, a cancer cell line, so in that respect, we don't feel like they're as relevant as using the IPSC hepatocytes. Um, in our hands, um, uh, we don't see the, the reproducibility as well as we do in the iPSC hepatocytes. Um, HEP-G2 cells require a lot of serum. Uh, the HEP-G2, the iPSC cells are serum-free. Um, that's one of the big differences, um, and it's, so you'll see that in compound effect. Fortunately, we haven't tested I N747 in the HEP-G2s, so I can't answer that question, but um, I think in terms of reproducibility and relevance, um, there's some um, significant advantages to using the IC um, uh, uh, hepatocytes. All right, thanks, Siobhan. Another question for you. Um, one of our audience members asks, are you, dif are you differentiating the hepatocytes from the CRM lines or is CDI making them for you? 
So CDI is making those, uh, they have access to the CERN bank and are, are making those uh, specific um, uh, cells that have harbor a mutation that's associated with NASH. They're um, actively making those into the iPSC hepatocytes. And so those will be, as I understand, available then to um, customers to use as part of their drug discovery uh, platform. Uh, question for you, Siobhan. Um, one of our audience members would like to know, how long does it take to induce the, the NASH phenotype? Right, so we do a 24-hour um, um, incubation of the of, uh, Dapsgargan or drug treatment, um, and it's 24 hours later that we um, do the uh, staining and visualization of the cells. All right. Uh, another question, I believe this one is also for you, Siobhan. Um, can you clarify if you used uh, iCell 1.0 hepatocytes in these applications and how their functions vary? Yeah, we originally started with uh, the iCell 1.0 hepatocytes and developed the um, original platform a, a couple of years ago with the lipid uptake, and then uh, more recently, just because it was more available to use the, the 2.0, we reestablished the assay in that one. So really, I don't think we see much difference because we've been able to use both of them. They both uh, uptake the lipid. It's just uh, once we started using version 2.0, which has a longer differentiation time and culture, and got that protocol down, we've just stayed with that protocol. But uh, we started with the 1.0, and we still had write nice data. So um, in, my, in our hands, we don't really see a difference. Hey, that's great. I'm just going to add Kobe, something. To, yeah. Yep, I'll just add to Siobhan. Please, yeah, go ahead, Kobe. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the 2.0 product was developed just in ter to really help, like I said, industrialize and scale up this differentiation process and, you know, doing a little bit of extra culture time ahead of running the assay is, is really the main difference. So um, all the data that was presented in the first half with the glucose regulation that was using the 2.0 version of the cells as well. And, you know, Siobhan did a great job answering that she had actually run the, you know, initial part of this assay development of both cell types and um, got very similar results. So that's good. Alrighty, thank you guys. Um, and we have one last question. Uh, one of the audience members uh, would like to know, uh, they were interested in using the, the technology to do uh, hep toxicity studies, and they want to know if your methods were approved by the FDA. So I can answer here. Um, you know, this is, there are a lot of um, governmental agencies and regulatory uh, parties that, you know, are dictate what to do in toxicity, so CIPA for cardiotox and HESI for neurotox, and, um, you know, we haven't, the IPS-derived hepatocytes haven't been, um, you know, in the discussion yet for um, hepatotoxicity, but, you know, we have lots of examples of how these are being used in hepatotox. Uh, there are several other, um, you know, publications and webinars and other things to help showcase how alternative models to primary human hepatocytes are used for hepatotoxicity, so we can help um, direct you to these resources offline. But great question, thanks. All right, great, thanks, Kobe. Uh, and with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on our site at www.genengnews.com for up to a year. So if you missed any parts of it, you can watch it again uh, or watch it over, or you can feel free to forward the link to your friends and colleagues, which we always recommend. Uh, I'd like to thank Siobhan and Kobe again for their informative presentations, and I'd like to thank the audience for their attention and very thoughtful questions. And a very special thanks to CDI Technologies for sponsoring this webinar. So hopefully we'll see you again in the near future for another Gen webinar. Goodbye for now. <laughs>